Good morning. I'm Natalie Roisman, Executive Director of the Georgetown Law Institute for Technology Law and Policy. On behalf of the Tech Institute and the Center for Privacy and Technology, welcome everyone to Georgetown Law and thank you so much for joining us here today for building on the dream, privacy, equity, and civil rights. This week, as you know, we celebrate the life and legacy of the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. To truly honor his memory and continue his fight requires more than just words of love and kindness. We're called to recognize the urgency of the need for real change. So we here at the Tech Institute and the Privacy Center are very grateful to our friends at NTIA for the opportunity to host this event and be part of something that will make tangible progress toward greater equity. We are training the next generation of lawyers and policymakers and we're proud to be showcasing for them the reality that technology policy can be civil rights work. Like you, I'm eager to hear what Assistant Secretary Davidson has to say. So I'll go ahead and turn the mic over to Amber Freely, president of the Georgetown Black Law Students Association, who will introduce the Assistant Secretary. Amber. Good morning. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, for those visiting Georgetown Law today, we just started classes this week and professors just started teaching. So busy, busy week, but we are so excited to host this amazing event right um, as we conclude MLK weekend. Um, like um, she said, I serve as BOLSA president this year. And one of the things that I am very prideful of is we're an advocacy group that is not afraid to talk about things that affect not only our community, but all marginalized communities. So I was completely honored to come today to welcome our guests, especially Secretary Davison on a meaningful conversation on equity and civil rights. So without further, and by the way, thank you for all the panelists for coming here today. Thank you for those joining, watching online and those that were able to make the trip today. So without further ado, thank you um, to all our guests for coming and we welcome Secretary Davison. Gosh, thank you. Thank you, Amber, for that introduction. And it's so great um, to be here with all of you at Georgetown. And um, thank you to the Georgetown Law Institute for Technology, Law and Policy, the Center for on Privacy and Technology for bringing us all together uh, in person and online to discuss the need for action at the intersection of privacy and civil rights. When I first started in this field at the Center for Democracy in 1995, which sounds like a really long time ago, <laughs> um, there were 40 million people on the internet. Today, there are roughly 5 billion. I think if you had asked a lot of us back in those early days of the web, if we would expect that 25 years later, in 2023, we would find ourselves without a comprehensive federal privacy law, I think many of us would have been surprised. And uh, for good reason, because there are now routine practices that would have shocked us back then, honestly. For example, detailed location information about our whereabouts is easily available for sale. Photos of faces are regularly scraped from the internet to power facial recognition algorithms. Companies building build detailed profiles of us based on the links we click on, the things we read online, even how long we pause as we scroll past a video. You all know this, but I can tell you 25 years ago, most advocates and academics in this space did not think that those practices would be permitted. And today they are commonplace. We know that the effects of these practices are damaging and are often most damaging to people of color and other marginalized communities. All of this cries out for a greater level of oversight now. Unchecked data collection also can end up in the hands of our adversaries, competitors, including China, and exploited in ways that undermine our national security. So for all these reasons, the president, in his op-ed published by the Wall Street Journal last week, has called on Congress to pass a comprehensive federal privacy law. President Biden is calling for clear limits on how companies can collect, use, and share personal information, highly personal information, from your health, genetic, and biometric data, as well as your internet history and personal communications. And in truth, we need a federal privacy law. Those, um, 
Though some states have taken the lead on privacy protections, far too many in America lack baseline protections for their privacy and personal information. A national standard is a much better way to operate. Where you live in a country should not dictate what kind of privacy you have. Privacy rights shouldn't change when you cross state lines. Without a national standard, the US is out of step with the rest of the world. We speak to governments around the world in my office and promote our vision of a free, open, global, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet. But it's very hard to do that when other countries see that we're not even able to provide basic privacy protections here at home. Protecting privacy and promoting innovation are complementary goals. Guardrails over how to use information, how to use data can promote innovation by encouraging consumer trust. And they offer clarity to companies about what they can build. And President Biden has also highlighted the need for even stronger protections for young people, calling for a ban of targeted advertising for children. The need for a comprehensive privacy law is especially acute when we consider the impact on disadvantaged groups. We know there are few areas where the consequences of these practices are more starkly felt than in the violations of security and privacy of marginalized communities. A few examples. Facial recognition tools today have disproportionately misidentified people of color, putting them at heightened risk of privacy invasion or unfair treatment. Online job and housing ads have contributed to the exclusion of some groups. Apps that collect our location data can reveal sensitive information such as religion or sexual orientation. For all these reasons, we need protections for these communities. Existing civil rights laws can help protect against some of these violations, but there is much more work to be done. At NTIA, where I work, a big part of our job is to focus on not just what the law says today, but what the law ought to say. It is with that in mind that today we are issuing a request for comment on how we can increase our vigilance at the intersection of privacy and civil rights. Our inquiry will help us analyze the outsized consequences that data practices have on marginalized communities and make specific recommendations on solutions. We know that addressing the disproportionate harms borne by these communities will take more than just privacy reforms, but increased protections are an important step toward that goal. That's why I'm delighted to be here with you to kick off this panel of privacy all-stars. These experts have already done stellar work thinking about these problems and the best solutions. I'm looking forward to hearing from them and all of you as we move forward with our inquiry at NTIA. In closing, I would just note, as all of you know, that we've been waiting a long time for a privacy law. That is why President Biden urged Democrats and Republicans to come together to pass strong bipartisan legislation and serious federal protections for Americans' privacy. We came close last year, perhaps the closest we've ever come to passing legislation in Congress, and, um, and we fell short. And I know that was disappointing to a lot of people work in this, who work in this space. Um, but, and some people might say, you know, maybe the time has passed and we should um, leave it to the states to do this, this hard work. But I would just say, I don't think that we can give up. As we celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this week, we should recall his advice. The time is always right to do what is right. The time is always right to do what is right. And what is right today is passing a privacy law that ensures that everyone in America has strong privacy protections. What is right today is making extra effort to protect the privacy of the most vulnerable among us. What is right today is making the US once again a global leader in protecting people online. And the right time for that is now. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here today, uh, all the work that you, your team, and the administration are doing on these critical issues. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Lindsay Barrett, who is an alumna of Georgetown Law. 
uh, a veteran of the law school's clinical programs as a staff attorney and teaching fellow and a former Fritz family fellow. Uh, Lindsay is in the NTIA Office of Policy Analysis and Development and is, as I understand it, if you like what's in the RFC, you should absolutely credit her with being the primary author. Uh, I'll leave it to Lindsay to introduce our panelists. Thank you so much to all of you on the panel for taking the time to be with us here today for this discussion. Uh, whatever, Kimmy. Uh, we are so lucky to have such a. There we go. Perfect. All right. Oh, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you, especially to Georgetown and our and our panelists. Uh, this is really a, a culmination of. Uh, a lot of work on an issue we care about very deeply, and um, we're so lucky to be able to draw upon these experts and to benefit from their expertise and their uh, and their knowledge, and to um, uh, that they are generous enough to improve our work and uh, make sure that we are doing things right. So uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We let's go down the line, um, starting with Bertram Lee. He's our Senior Policy Counsel on Data Decision-Making and Artificial Intelligence at the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, he previously, this is why we go with the one-page version. Um, <laughs> he previously uh, worked at Policy Counsel at Public Knowledge and as uh, Policy Counsel at the U.S. Uh, House Committee for Education and Labor. Uh, Professor Laura Moy is the Director of uh, the Communications and Technology Law Clinic right here as well as the faculty director of the Center on Privacy and Technology. Uh, prior to that, um, she worked on technology policy issues at New America and at Public Knowledge. And we have Frank Torres, who is the Civil Rights Technology Fellow at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, he, pri uh, prior to that, he spent 20 years at Microsoft where he retired as the Director of Public Policy in the Office of Responsible AI and uh, was also the senior policy counsel at Consumers Union before that. And we have Brandon Tucker, who is the senior director of policy and government affairs at Color of Change. And prior to that, uh, Brandon was the policy director of the ACLU of Ten Tennessee. There we go. So I thought I'd just ease us in with a bright, broad question that we can sort of take wherever we wanna go. Uh, how do commercial data practices implicate civil rights and equity? Uh, what are some of the harms that marginalized communities experience due to commercial privacy invasions? And anybody feel free to jump in and with us. I'm happy to jump in, uh, but happy to defer, you wanna? Okay, all right, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and thank you so much for convening this panel and for um, those fantastic remarks by Assistant Secretary Davidson. Uh, so maybe I'll start by just building on a couple of the things that Assistant Secretary Davidson said. Um, he talked a little bit about, uh, about photos um, and facial recognition and other facial analysis technologies and how they can disproportionately uh, impact people of color. And sometimes facial analysis, excuse me, facial analysis algorithms might be used in a hiring context um, to evaluate how someone does in an interview. And so when bias is built in, that can have a disproportionate effect that could result in fewer job opportunities or offers for people of color or perhaps for, um, for people with disabilities whose facial, uh, whose facial expressions and speech patterns might be um, a little different than uh, than the average. And then, and I'll just talk about one other, which is, um, which is location. And, um, and in fact, in our, in our clinic last year, we filed a complaint, an unofficial complaint with, um, with the Federal Trade Commission on behalf of the Council on American Islamic Relations, pointing out, as Assistant Secretary Davidson mentioned, um, that location information may be disproportionately collected from people of certain religious minorities. 
And that could have an effect on people of those religious minorities. So for example, American Muslims who are aware of this tracking um, might, be, might experience less freedom to use their devices and online services the way that they would like to out of fear of the repercussions that could fall on them. So I, I'll just stop with those two examples, but there are many more. Yeah, and I, I think I'll jump in here too. I mean, I, I think the harms are pretty evident if you read the materials uh, that the White House put out related to uh, their announcement around the AI Bill of Rights um, and their blueprint. Um, if you take a look at the comments that were filed in the recent FTC request for comments, um, lots of comments filed, lots of harms that they're out there, whether it be in housing, um, whether it be the use of facial recognition technology, whether it be um, in, even in healthcare, um, where the use of technology kind of a little bit unfettered, a little bit believing the hype, a little bit about just using as much data as they can and you know, kind of we'll worry about the outcomes later have resulted in uh, definite harms to uh, people, um, including and especially those of, of color and in marginalized communities. Um, I think a big difference, and, and Secretary Davidson, uh, you know, talked about like back in 1995, um, I just it was at Consumers Union at the time, uh, Alan was at CDT. And, and there's a big difference, I think, between then and now. Then it was about data security, notice, consent, um, you know, making sure that people's data, you know, they had a, the ability to correct it, to see what was collected about them. What has changed with the emergence of the use of that data? It used to be called big data, and now it's kind of a, all wrapped up into AI. The, the big difference, a big difference is the implications on how that data is used to drive algorithms that could make decisions about people. And this is where the civil rights comes to the civil rights come to the fore. Because if that data set, that training data, the way the algorithm is crafted, if attention isn't paid, you wind up with outcomes that discriminate, that are biased. Um, and in some cases, probably you shouldn't be using that algorithm for that particular instance anyway. And so when we worked on the ADPPA um, during this last Congress, it, it, the recognition was clear that data rights are civil rights. We think that's uh, very important to note. I can jump in. Um, I think if we start at a base level and take a step back, racial discrimination is present in the physical world and we can all recognize uh, and see that. And I think the step to, uh, to discrimination is an eye test. You, you see a black person on the street, you see a disabled person on the street, you, you make assumptions uh, with data, uh, with data collection and the reduction of privacy or the, the lack of privacy laws, you no longer need that eye test, you need people's information. And the, the business models of, um, let's say social media companies, all they need is your time and they need your data. They, they offer you a service for free in exchange for your profile. And so all those things we can imagine in the real world and the physical world are just meeting you on your screen. And so as we have this, this discussion today, we can talk about discriminatory advertisements, we can talk about surveillance and location uh, access, we can talk about the availability of um, seeing who you are associated with, what, what locations you, you frequent, uh, but just recognize that everything that marginalized groups, people of color, black people uh, experience on the day to day, uh, whether it be financial discrimination, educational discrimination, uh, environmental discrimination, um, it, it's meeting you uh, on your devices now. And, it's, it, and it could be monetized uh, against your benefit. And so I, I, I just wanna level set that the, the conversation we're having, it's just a relocation from the street to your screen. And, and all, all those things that, that we're discussing today uh, have rapidly moved ahead of what can be legislated or what has been legislated in, in the street. We try to attest for discrimination. We try to stick up for women's rights and access to reproductive products or uh, reproductive, excuse me, um, 
uh, reproductive health. And we try to solve for civil rights and voting rights and, and the, the right to unionize. All those things can be met with the eye, but now we're dealing with a whole set of new issues online that are moving past our awareness, our ability to understand, and, and also beyond what our politics is built for and, 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 and dealt to solve for. And that's why the conversation with these civil rights leaders today is so important to inform the conversation, to inform our legislation, and to inform how we're, how we're having this discussion uh, to protect marginalized groups. So I'm going to add a little bit of nuance to this conversation, and I agree completely with all of my panelists, but there's a kind of like balanced perspective that I want to kind of add to this in a way, because I think when we're talking about micro-targeting, for example, right, micro-targeting has allowed small businesses, particularly small businesses from marginalized communities, right, whether they're women-owned, Latinx-owned, um, Asian-owned, Black-owned, right, to expand their reach in a social media age when their large companies have not targeted their products toward these communities, right? Um, the black hair care kind of expansion has grown because of social media, because they have been able to micro-target. Now, with that said, those micro-targeting proxies and the ways in which the micro-targeting happens, particularly on social media, but broadly within the kind of ad ecosystem, disproportionately impacts marginalized communities in a number of ways, because it's based in a context, as my fellow panelists have said, and the way that historic discrimination um, has played in our society and the role that that historic discrimination plays currently, right, with the average uh, GDP or the average income of Black or the average net worth of Black families being zero, right? How are you not going to be able to say that micro-targeting and targeting of these communities doesn't have a disparate impact on their economic outcomes? With that said, it doesn't mean that it's all bad, but it does mean that we have to pay particular attention to the areas of law that have already been codified within the context of civil rights law, whether we're talking about housing, employment, credit and lending, education, services. We talk about this thing called public accommodations. Very few people know what it means because it means everything. And we have not talked about it within the context of the digital ecosystem. And we need to do a better job, I think, moving forward of saying, hey, we have all of these laws on the books. What does it mean to enforce them fully in the digital context? What does it mean to get buy-in from not only civil society, but industry to better understand the rights and responsibilities of these folks as they frame these things moving forward? Because the world is not white. The world is a multicultural group of people who are not monolithic. But the internet has been based on the ideas and a gaze for white people. And we have to have that honest conversation. And if our tech only represents the idea and the gaze of Western society and does not take into account the world and even the diversity within those societies, the tech is bad. It's redundant. It doesn't function in the way that it needs to in order for it to be sustainable for the long term because then you're not going to have the technologies that actually serve the world as it stands right now. Thank you so much for this tremendous introduction to our discussion. It's really, um, really wonderful. So um, in terms of these problems that, that we've been discussing and um, potential reforms, um, whether it's better approaches to existing, existing laws or new laws, other um, new approaches to enforcement, um, excuse me. Uh, what would you say are the biggest challenges that policymakers, um, including but not limited to NTIA, uh, should be focusing on when it comes to promoting an equitable approach to privacy reform? So, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll take this on, and, and I was thinking about challenges um, in kind of I mean, we, we could list out, you know, particular topics, but, but I think it goes a little bit broader than that. I think we know what to do. I think we have the, the tools in the toolbox. And yeah, there might be gaps in existing law that need to be filled, but then we just ought to do it. I mean, so, so I came up with th three challenges, um, but, but they're more like to-dos as well. Implement the AI Bill of Rights throughout the government and have companies use that as, as a template for what they ought to be doing, has a comprehensive federal privacy law that contains strong civil rights protections, especially related to the use of data, 
And, and this is, I guess, the carrot and the stick, call, call it a positive and negative approach. How do you incentivize companies to act today? Some companies are moving forward. All companies now, I think, have some principles that they've signed on to somewhere. But we need to move beyond just the principles and talk about how should these tools be assessed? How should they be tested? Like, why should you be using a facial recognition technology that you're not sure it works properly in identifying people when the results of that could end up with somebody being arrested? And that's typically people of color. And it's happened. How do you monitor the outcomes? Once this technology is put out there, who's minding the store to see whether or not uh, they, they're desperate impacts or uh, some sort of bias and discrimination? How do you train employees so that they understand the implications, both the software engineers, because certainly the companies that develop the technology have some responsibility, but also when a bank or some other commercial entity picks up that technology and goes to use it with their own data sets and whatnot, who's kind of watching that, that ecosystem? And I think that's a challenge because we'll get suppliers and developers and vendors and others kind of all pointing the finger at one another, and we need to resolve that issue. And then the, the last challenge that, that, that I've thought about is entities have to be willing to just say no. And at one point in time, and I wish I could have found it, I had a list of, you know, all these like stories that came out, you know, in the UK, you know, we're going to use during the pandemic AI to help determine, you know, where kids get placed in colleges and that somebody was sold a bill of goods. And it turned out that that technology did not work the way it was intended to work. But nonetheless, on, based upon the promises that were made, it was put into use. I completely agree with Bert. There's lots of benefits to the technology, no doubt. And there are probably some uses where well, if it works or it doesn't work, we may not care so much. But the more AI becomes ubiquitous, the bigger the challenge for us is to figure out how to rein it in. Again, I think we know what to do. We've been working on privacy legislation for <laughs> much too long um, to overlay kind of some parameters around the use of data when it comes to AI and these emerging technologies. I would submit it's a challenge, but it isn't that far away. Uh, I think we started off kind of hot. I'm, I think we should thank the uh, the, the Institute uh, for Tech Law and Policy and NTIA for, for convening us here today. Um, can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so what are the biggest challenges? So we've uh, basically, you have your laundry list. Here's what's wrong. Here's yeah. what I hate. What are the things that um, in triaging that deserve to go right to the top? Yeah. Um, so a color of change for a racial justice organization, we tackle a few issues, uh, criminal legal system, uh, tech policy, voting rights, and economic justice. And I, I do wanna, so there's two things that come from that. One, our problems are intersectional. Uh, a lot of issues uh, cross one another and impact one another. And to highlight something that Frank just says, it's a very important sentence, we know what to do. So the biggest problem then becomes our systems of government, uh, our representative government. And when I talk about the intersectionality of our issues, the people who would be advocating for uh, Blacks, black, the Black community, Latinx community, LGBT, disabled community, those voices are, 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 are minimalized in Congress. Those voices are minimalized in state legislatures across the country. They're minimalized in our in our federal government, and so I, I I have to I have to elevate the the brokenness of our access to the ballot, our access to democracy, our uh, the the way we disenfranchise um, communities of color, and how there are upwards of six million people in this country who cannot cast a ballot because of a a felony record knowing that certain communities are over-policed, knowing that we have experienced mass incarceration, knowing that removing people out of uh, the voters' roles will maintain a status quo, and the status quo has been maintained for too long. And so I, you know, I, I want to uplift Frank's point. He's got the answers. 
The answers are are, are not are is it's it's not in, encrypted, and I so we we need to go a step further and say why can't we accomplish big things? Why can't we advocate for communities that are being targeted um, disproportionately? Why can't we advocate for communities that are being targeted for financial and mon monetary gain? Is the will there? Are the voices there? Are the lived experiences there? And so when we talk about the intersectionality of our issues, uh, it's, it's, it's important to talk about privacy and, 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 and how big data uh, impacts our lives disproportionately. But it's also important to know that there's only a few people who represent me in Congress, who, who had share my lived experience in, in, in Congress. There's only a few people who know what it's like to be over-policed, who know that over-policing is happening not only in the streets in New York City or in Chicago or in, in any major city, but your data is also being, can, can be collected and, and bought by law enforcement now to, to not only know where, you are, where you're at, but who you're associating with. And so I, I, I wanna uplift the, one of the biggest impediments is representation. Um, I agree completely. Uh, and I'll, so I'll add a couple of things. So, and one I think goes back actually to something that you said early on, Frank, that was about recognizing the importance of recognizing um, that civil rights are, are privacy rights. And uh, you know, I think sometimes this conversation, when we talk about how privacy needs to encompass protections against disparate impact flowing from uses of data, sometimes that's framed as like a, a new change, you know, a shift in the conversation. And, and it, it's not. I mean, the truth is, is that historically, uh, our privacy laws have been developed for the purpose of protecting people from harms that flow from uses of their data. And so, I mean, you go way back and look at the history behind uh, medical confidentiality that underlies um, the privacy protections built into HIPAA. And you see that there were concerns about the harms that could flow to patients uh, as a result of information that they had to share with medical providers in really sensitive contexts. And that's, you know, that, that's from antiquity. Uh, you know, you look at the, the, the foundation of our financial privacy laws and our, uh, our educational privacy laws, um, our, our children's privacy laws, uh, and you see that there's this same kind of concern discussed over, you know, over the course of, um, of the past century that most U.S. privacy law has developed. There's this conversation constantly being had uh, about how uses, how data collected in ways that people often can't avoid um, might later come back to harm them. And what do we need to do to protect them from those harms? And all these harms that we're talking about in the civil rights context, where data is collected about people and then used to make decisions, oftentimes about important life opportunities in ways that disproportionately affect historically disadvantaged communities, those are harms flowing from data. That is the heart of what privacy is supposed to protect us from. And so, so I would say one challenge is for, for us to understand that that actually is what privacy is supposed to do. And this is not a reframing of the conversation. This is a continuation of US privacy law um, that has been around for a long time. And then I, I'll name one other thing. I know that we're running short on time, so I'll try to be really quick here. But you know, one of the, one of the preeminent professional algorithmic auditors, Kathy O'Neill, um, has written this really great, great piece. She wrote this great piece a few years ago that was about how sometimes companies hire her uh, or, or excuse me, start talking to her and thinking about engaging her and, and, um, and now she has a, a company that does this work uh, to, to examine algorithms and look for bias. But oftentimes after the first couple conversations, she gets a call from the general counsel's office saying, actually, please don't do this, right? And, and all of that is a, a long way of saying, Right now, the incentives are not set up, even if people working within companies are interested in learning about the harms that may flow from their uses of data, the incentives are not set up to enable them to do that work without running into potential legal concerns. And so one of the, one of the challenges affecting policymakers that they really should be considering is how to force those incentives, right? How to force that analysis to take place um, so that we can avoid the most, the most harmful practices. 
And to piggyback off of that, I would say that um, we want to policymakers to help ensure that the benefits of the digital economy are seen by everyone. And I think when we think about civil rights law, we think about it as like a bundle of rights that is was fully given to all Americans once enacted, right? But in actuality, there are a set of economic um, kind of uh, laws that per, that allow people to fully participate in the broader economy. The harms that we're ta that we're talking about, whether it's education, housing, employment, credit, and lending, those are the fastest ways, regardless of really what era it is within the context of the United States. Those concepts are the fastest way in order to gain economic stability, regardless of where you are in the kind of like American system. And so having a stable job, having a stable home, being able to get a loan, being able to get access to a reasonable education, being able to access goods and services in an equitable fashion, whether by um, private entities or by the government, right? Whether it's title, we're talking about Title VI in this context, shout out to David Brody. But like, I think there's a, there's a lot of work that we have to do and that the American government has to do in order to better intersect all of these um, harms and think about them within the context of allowing people to fully participate in the digital economy in ways that they have not been able to so far. But we have a unique opportunity because this is data and not people. We have a unique opportunity at this moment in a bipartisan, bicameral fashion to put forward legislation that would allow more people to fully participate in our economy, to help grow our GDP to help alleviate some of the economic insecurity that we're facing right now from the broader in the broader context that we have, right? This is a way to actually grow the pie, not shrink it. We're not trying to stop people from getting access. We're allowing more people more access to more things. And that in and of itself is a potential good. And so that is where I think industry, um, civil society and government needs to work together to think about ways that we can grow the pot together. And I think that's the unique opportunity that I think in, that I think policymakers have right now. This is one of the rare bipartisan kind of issues. And I think one of the things that's going to, I think, manifest itself in the next few years is that we're going to see more support for this across the board. We got our work cut out for us. Uh, Brandon, you were speaking really eloquently about uh, the importance of representation in uh, in government and the the effects of of not having it, um, what are um, what are some things that policymakers can can do to better draw on the input and experiences of the communities that they serve as they devise responses to privacy harms experienced by marginalized communities? I will also uh, Frank um, mentioned the AI Bill of Rights. Um, one thing that I was really impressed by was the um, White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy when they scheduled their listening sessions. They um, we're very conscious of, all right, if I want to hear from the public, people have to work. So we're going to have them at multiple times of day. We're going to have some um, that take place after nine to five. Um, so what are the kinds of things like that that policymakers can do to ensure that they are hearing from everyone, that they are hiring um, people who are representative of the communities they serve um, and any other reforms? Yeah, um, I think this is... Uh, representative of a solid step that we can be taking. Um, I have to be cognizant that lawmakers have blind spots. They don't know what they don't know. And you brought up a, a very good point uh, on hiring. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, Color of Change signed on to a letter to ensure that uh, members of Congress, new members and leadership, uh, their staffs uh, represent it uh, the, the communities they, they advocate for. Um, and so, and that doesn't mean just junior level positions. That means uh, senior level positions uh, in congressional offices, in your state legislative uh, staffs, uh, but you, you don't know what you don't know. And as a white man or as a white woman, your lived experiences are going to bear out in your legislation and in your opinions. And the more you can di diversify the voices that are uh, impacting uh, your, your positions, pro or uh, against, the, the more that you can have lived experience and, and diversify uh, your, your statements on the record as they pertain to important issues that impact uh, um, communities of color, 
uh, then the better off you are. But if your if your if your office, uh, if your agency, uh, if your department uh, looks like a um, I don't know, uh, a, a financial firms, you know, whatever. Um, if it doesn't, if it, if it doesn't look like America, uh, then your opinions and, and your and your thoughts and your uh, positions aren't going to benefit all of America. And so, uh, again, to uh, to put a pin on it, uh, people uh, have have narrow views. Uh, the more we can broaden those, uh, the more we can have uh, the, the the voices of color. Uh, in the room and the voices of those who come from disabled communities and LGBT, uh, then the, the the better off the outcome for all of us. And I would say, if, if there's time, yeah. Um, so all that all those points extremely well taken and and, and spot on. Um, but it's not just a matter of diversifying the workforce, or for policymakers to hear from folks like us who are all policy wonks. It's also important to actually reach out to the public and in the communities that could be impacted by the technology. Um, and, and you said that the, the listening tours and being mindful and cognizant and aware of can't schedule during the day because people work, right? What about childcare, that sort of thing. Um, at this point was driven home to me. Um, one of the most powerful things I experienced um, in, in my career I was helping out with an organization called Partnership on AI. I had a board meeting in Philadelphia. The reason in Philadelphia is the progressive prosecutor and the public defender had gotten together because they realized the prison system there was completely overcrowded, in large part people waiting for their trial dates. And they were trying to figure out like kind of how can we use technology to help solve this problem? They actually brought in ex-offenders, ex-people that had been charged who had been held over, some found innocent and released, but had been locked away for, for, for some time. And so the, the, the board of the Partnership on AI, think of the top technologists from the big companies that you all know about. So these are like super smart people, not policy wonks. So you could see their minds churning with the challenge of how can we use technology and data to help solve this problem and get these people you know, out so they're not held over. And maybe we can collect data, more data about their family life and all this stuff. And finally, one of the young men said, you know what you could do that could really be helpful? Could you get the court some scheduling software? Because half the time it's, they don't know when to take the person for their trial date. The judge cancels or reschedules and nobody knows. The police officer or witness doesn't show up and they get held over and then it's another couple of weeks. And, and it's like, it's just, if people just listen and talk to the people that are actually going through the experience, they might come up with like solutions that they might not have thought about and might not waste their time on stuff that just isn't working. So I, I say, so it's the power of like, I don't know all the answers on how you do it, but you need, like people need to think about how to do it. And you've got a wealth of resources in this area from academics to institution, you know, academic institutions, think tanks, others, that could probably figure out how, how to make that happen in a productive and useful way. So I would say that I think community education is incredibly important, but what Frank said really hits home because it is important to ask people what they think they need to have them fully participate in the digital economy. Like, I think a lot of companies are so afraid of feedback, right? There's a review, um, there's a fear of reviews, right? And there's a, there's a fear of feedback, but that's actually like the most valuable asset that you can have and ask for. Because if you have, if you ask people, um, so I'm from DC, if you ask people in Southeast what their barrier to access is from a digital economic perspective, a lot of them will say internet access. A lot of people will say, you know, the maybe the housing site doesn't go up and, and as well, or it's not mobile accessible, right? There are a lot of fixes that Frank said, right? It's like the court scheduling software, right? There are a lot of fixes that technology can help solve, but we think about it in a different way. Instead of asking people what they want, we tell people what they need. And I think that's the wrong way of framing this. It's just like giving people what they want, what, they, what would make their lives better. How could they, how would they think about technology helping them, 
right? Whether it's uh, scheduling uh, free childcare facilities um, here in DC, whether it's using these different contexts of technology to be able to say, hey, this is how you can access your benefits in a fast way, right? So that you're not waiting in line so that you don't have to go through all of these hoops and ladders in order um, to get access to benefits. These are ways that we can think about community um, needs instead of thinking then on the back end about how they've used, how, how companies have used technologies to accidentally inundate themselves with community harms and like effectuate community harms. Think about community needs first and then go back um, as opposed to the opposite. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so we've talked about sort of um, different privacy reform efforts and um, the, the value and utility of um, looking to the laws we have and how they could be um, how they could be used more effectively. Um, in, in that sort of vein, what lessons can privacy reform efforts learn from battles to enact civil rights protections, um, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Americans with Disability Act? And maybe we go to Laura first. Sure. Yeah, and I think I can be relatively quick here. And it's just to say that, um, you know, history will tell a story about what we are doing right now. History is going to tell a story about the privacy law that eventually gets passed and whether or not it actually protects the most vulnerable among us, the historically disadvantaged communities um, uh, who are underrepresented and have been the subject of institutional racism that has existed. Uh, for centuries in our country. Um, and, and, and if we do the right thing here and we do manage to get legislation passed that protects against the very real harms that are falling disproportionately on those communities, history is gonna tell a nice story. And, uh, and, you know, and I think that sometimes, sometimes policymakers forget that. And there's a lot of fighting on uh, uh, pushing back against the incorporation of these really important protections into a privacy law. Um, a lot of clinging to old notions of, oh, privacy is just supposed to be about control and, and providing people with notice about information collection and giving them uh, the opportunity to consent. Um, but it actually needs to go much further and, uh, and history will judge us based on our performance on that aspect. So I'm going to jump the line and I apologize, but I really, I love this. I love this question. And it was probably my favorite question. Um, I'd say that there are three things that kind of privacy reform efforts can learn from the civil rights movement. One, read the civil rights lobby. Um, it was kind of like about the creation of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, um, the organization that Frank uh, uh, works at, the organization I was a part of, and it helps explain how these groups came together to help create what is essentially now the civil rights lobby and like the coalition of groups that now move in unison towards creating a better space. Um, I'd say that start, but first is coalition coalition and building together and actually working with groups. I think there's been a long time uh, before I really started in the privacy space where um, privacy and civil rights were seen as separate and now they've come together. And I think that has been such, that has been so needed on a number of contexts because they're actually dealing with the same issues just from different vantage points. Working together in coalition, moving together um, will actually, I think, help privacy uh, reform efforts uh, move forward. Um, comparisons to other companies, another thing that is very similar um, to kind of what was happening in the 60s with the civil rights movement. Uh, what was, what, what another impetus as to why the civil rights laws got passed was that there was a push to kind of compare the US um, to kind of like more communist states and saying like, well, communist nations give more rights to more people. And so the US government said, well, no, we can't stand for that. Now we have GDPR. And even Indonesia has just passed a general privacy, data privacy law. We can make comparisons to other countries like Brazil and so um, Indonesia, the EU with GDPR, so many others. I mean, even Africa is really starting to move. Uh, the continent is really starting to move toward uh, general data privacy laws. And so that's something that we can use as a comparison as well. Why should we be the last to be able to get these rights that the rest of the world has? And then lastly, um, as I stated before, a lot of the civil rights laws were based on the on the concept of economic inclusion. And if we are going to survive, if we are going to make it through um, what is seemingly an endless pandemic, if we are going to make it through um, this like really tough economic period, we're going to have to include more people inside of the workforce and take them into account. One of the ways that we can do that is digital. And that is a key component of this. But right now, the digital space is in kind of like a no man's or, or no person's land, I should say. 
Um, there are civil rights laws that attach, but the clarity of them by agencies of jurisdiction has not necessarily been there. This is again an opportunity for us to work together with industry, with government, with civil society to build a broader coalition and think about how do we include the most amount of people in the context of the digital economy. And so those would be my. Thank you. Anybody else want to quickly jump in? We are unfortunately. I, quickly, um, I think primary lesson that we can draw uh, from the Civil Rights Act is demand. Um, you know, these powerful institutions and companies will concede nothing uh, without a coordinated, unified, educated demand. And, you know, as we uh, um, elevate 1964, we can also recognize that it was 100 years after the 13th Amendment. Uh, and so, um, and everybody was educated, everybody in the nation was educated on Jim Crow and racism and discrimination. And so now we're dealing with people who are not uh, fully informed on how their lives are being tracked and monetized. And so demand and education are, are lessons I think we can draw from uh, 64. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much to our wonderful panelists for joining us today. Uh, thank you to everyone who came. Thank you to everyone watching online. And thank you to Georgetown for hosting us in this magnificent space that I am furious didn't exist when I was at school here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much.